We say, Lord, take control. We say, Lord, here am I. We say, Lord, use me. But are we true? Amen. That was a blessing, wasn't it? Amen. How many wish you could sing? <laughs> I mean, you can sing, but wish you could sing on tune, right? What a wonderful thing just to um, make your talents available for the Lord to use. And appreciate that song. Ruthie wrote that song. That is why you've never heard that song before. Isn't that good? We're going to take our Bibles this morning. We're going to be in Luke chapter number 19. Uh, be mindful. Um, this time of year, we're going to be getting um, our tax returns. We're also going to be getting money from the federal government. Like They're like Santa Claus, man. They're just giving us money again and again. Um, and so we have an investment opportunity. Returns guaranteed. Hundredfold returns. Uh, we're trying to pay off our mortgage right now. Uh, and so every dollar you give towards our mortgage retirement uh, is matched by $1. Um, I know that we just made a payment last week, $29,000 towards wow, our own mortgage. God, so man. praise the Lord for that. Um, and I think the month before that we were able to put ten dollars or 11000 something like that towards our mortgage. 
Uh, so be faithfully giving towards that. And again, dollar for dollar. Uh, so if you give $100 towards that, it'll actually be $200. Um, you know, if you get, I don't know what this next stimulus is going to be. Uh, but, uh, I mean, this is, this is going to be something that is going to go towards the, per the perpetuity. Is that a word? I heard it one time. I thought it sounded pretty good. Of our church. And, uh, and so, you know, after we're long gone, uh, we're, we're a memory to our children and, you know, whatever. Uh, Lord willing, God willing, we had laid a foundation here, uh, not only spiritually but also financially, that generations can continually worship in this place. And uh, being debt free is a very, very important thing. So we're working towards that. So Luke chapter number 19. We're going to be in verse number 41 down through verse number 48 this morning. Uh, when you find your place there, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Luke 19, 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known even at least in thy day the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and uh, compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And he went into the temple, began to t cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him and could not find what they might do for all the people were very attentive to hear him. We're going to look here this morning at the cleansing of the temple. And of course, we've been on a journey through Luke and here the Lord has gotten down to his passion week. And this would have been right uh, around Palm Sunday. And in this very week, he is going to offer himself up as sacrifice uh, for the sins, the sins of the whole world. And here we see our Lord and Savior looking at Jerusalem. Uh, and sighing out, crying over Jerusalem. This is the second place uh, that we see here in Scripture. We're going to see a third where the Lord weeps. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. And it was always in regards to the people's spiritual condition. He wasn't weeping over Lazarus because Lazarus was dead, but because the people sorrowed as those who had no hope. And the hope was there. Uh, and he wept over the people's suffering because of their unbelief. And uh, here our Lord cries over people's lost opportunity. And so we'll see here today the cleansing of the temple. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, pray with me as I pray. Let's ask God's blessing upon His service, God's blessing upon His Word. Uh, so pray with me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for uh, the goodness of the Lord we have seen in the land of the living. We thank You for all the blessings that we have enjoyed and been blessed with over this last week. I think of Romans chapter number 2 where it says, The goodness of God leadeth us to repentance. And Lord, help us to recognize and be thankful for all the good things you have bestowed upon us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to have just the spirit of contrition and worship this morning as we look into your precious and holy word. I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ would be uh, lifted up in our midst. I pray that we would be able just to sense uh, his presence and blessing upon the service. I pray that you would just illuminate our minds and our hearts by your Holy Spirit this morning. I pray that we would be in awe of your word. I pray that we'd be fascinated by it. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen this, your flock. We thank you, Lord, uh, for the journey that we get to travel together, the pilgrimage we get to travel Amen. here on this earth together. And Lord, we thank you for our home in heaven that awaits us. And Lord, I pray that you would Help us and bless us just one more time here this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, so last time here we were in the 
gospel according to Luke, we saw the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, where from the Mount of Olives, the Lord made a king's procession on a donkey from the Mount of Olives down towards the temple. Uh, and and uh, here there's a great, uh, great crowd there is Passover feast week and determined that the crowd of the city had swelled to two to three million people. The historian Josephus says there's approximately 256,000 uh, lambs slain this week. It'd be about 10 people for every lamb. So between two and three million people were inside of that city. And so great multitudes, travelers, crowds, pilgrims saw the Lord Jesus Christ, saw this procession. Uh, and this would have been known unto the crowd. These, this, this crowd would have understand the this, this significance of what the Lord Jesus Christ did at that moment. Uh, and then they would have understood the prophecy uh, in Zechariah 9.9 that, Behold, thy king cometh, meek and lowly, sitting upon a donkey. And so the Lord sat upon that colt, that uh, donkey's colt, and was, uh, was on this procession down into the city. The crowd is crying out uh, to the king. And uh, here we see here in verse number 38, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And so in our country, a donkey, a mule, uh, uh, something that is related to a donkey <laughs> is something uh, that is very lowly and insignificant. But there in the Eastern culture, you know, the beast, of, the only beast of burden brought from Egypt was a donkey. And this is what kings would ride in peacetime when they are riding in the city. The only time that you would ride a horse is if it was wartime. Uh, so the first time the Lord Jesus Christ came, he offered himself up as the crowd's Messiah. They recognized his offering up and they shouted out, Hosanna in the highest. So they're saying, Jesus, save now. Uh, they're waving palm branches to the king, saying victory. Uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ came, King of Salem, King of Peace, offered himself up to the crowd, holds out himself that they could, by their own volition, receive him as their Messiah and receive him as king. And of course, this fickle crowd here uh, in this short week, uh, Pilate is going to present before this crowd the king. Behold, I present to you your king. And they reject the king. We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him, crucify him. Uh, Pilate is going to put a plaque above the Lord Jesus Christ's head that says, The King of the Jews. The King of the Jews. Now, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, and the next time he comes back, it's not coming back in a jihad, he's coming back in a yeeha. <laughs> he's going to come back on a white horse. Uh, and he's gonna, he is going to take that same exact route that he took back 2,000 years ago. And his feet are going to touch down upon the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives are going to be uh, drawn asunder. And, and uh, there's going to be a great earthquake in the city. And he's going to make the procession from the Mount of Olives uh, down into the temple and proclaim himself King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The first time uh, the Lord Jesus Christ came here as a lamb and offering himself up as a ransom for many. And he did make peace uh, between your soul and God the Father by his sacrifice for your sins and for mine and offered up himself as the Lamb of God this Passover week, uh, this Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world, expunge your sins. And then uh, this morning he offers up to you just the same way as he did to that city, uh, here 2,000 years ago, offers himself up to you that you can take him as your king. Verse number 41, uh, and it says there, And when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over the city. Uh, this morning we're going to speak on the cleansing of the temple. We're going to turn to several different places here. Uh, first I want to look at the temple uh, in its history. Turn, if you will, to Hebrews chapter number 7. Hebrews chapter number 7. We're going to see from uh, the scripture, I'm going to show you my, little fa my favorite piece of real estate on the whole world, the whole entire world, is uh, this Temple Mount. 
And we'll see that uh, this Temple Mount, where the Temple is, uh, was in Christ's day, and uh, where it will be in the future is the prophetic timepiece we find in the Word of God. Uh, but in Hebrews chapter 7, and look at verse number 1, here we see the temple history, the temple history. For it says, Melchizedek, I want you to notice this, King of Salem. If you're in the habit of underlining things, I'd underline uh, the word king. King of Salem, priest, I'd underline priest, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Uh, so this man, Melchizedek, here we see that he is king, that he was priest. Then also it says he blessed Abraham. Uh, and so a prophet blesses Abraham. That we see a prophet, priest, and king by the name of Melchizedek. A prophet, priest, and king are the threefold office of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to notice a little bit more about this man, Melchizedek. It says, To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also, king of Salem, which is, Salem means peace, so it says, which is the king, singular, of peace. Notice this, verse number three. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abiding a priest continually. Let me ask you a question. Who's the only thing that's without beginning, without end? We see John chapter number one, um, that the word, uh, by him all things were created. So this is here, is the creator God without beginning, without end, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see him on a little piece of real estate there in Palestine. Uh, and that is Salem. And he's there as a priest. He's there as a king. He's there as a prophet. And Abraham comes and ties to this man. And, uh, and this man blesses Abraham. We see an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Psalms uh, 76, 1 and 2, it says this. In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle. And his dwelling place is in Zion. Uh, there's a rule of interpreting scripture, and that's called law first mention. And um, holiness is a very important theme of the Bible, wouldn't you say? I uh, you know the number one attribute of God is holy. Uh, we think of God as love, and He is love. But uh, holiness is the number one attribute of God. Uh, the Bible says this, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Uh, He's holy to the nth uh, degree that He is the holy God. Over 700 times in Scripture it says that God is holy. Uh, well, the first mention of holy in the Bible is found in Exodus chapter 3 in verse number 5. And here is the Lord calling out to Moses out of the burning bush. And he said, And draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Uh, the Lord said the dirt that you're standing on, Moses, is holy, has significance. So there's certain areas, there's certain places in the Bible that hold spiritual significance, certain areas, and undoubtedly here's Salem where we see the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, there in the book of Genesis, we see that there is a holy piece of real estate over there. So it begins with Jesus. The temple history begins with Jesus, Melchizedek, King of Salem. Uh, it continues through the father of the faithful, uh, Father Abraham. And turn, if you will, to Genesis chapter number 22. Genesis chapter number 22, and look, if you will, to verse number 5. And it says, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here 
with the S, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. You know, the first mention of worship here in the Bible is right here. Here's Abraham. He is going to take his son, his only begotten son, Isaac, and he is going to offer his only begotten son up before the Lord on Mount Moriah. And this would be the exact location where the king of Salem, Melchizedek, was from. And this would be the exact location uh, where the Temple Mount uh, was in Jesus' time and where that Temple Mount is today uh, that Abraham was going to offer up Isaac. I want you to notice down in verse number 8. Here's a prophetic utterance uh, by Abraham. So Isaac says, well, where is the lamb for a sacrifice? Of course, I would imagine Isaac was a little bit uh, concerned that they're going to go sacrifice. They're going to go worship God here in Mount Moriah. Uh, and there is no lamb for the sacrifice. Uh, and here's a prophetic utterance by uh, Abraham. Uh, God will provide himself a lamb. Himself a lamb. I don't know if Abraham knew exactly what he was saying, but here's a prophetic utterance that perhaps he didn't even know the exact extent. But God is going to offer himself up as the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, there on Mount Moriah. Look, if you will, down to verse number 13. So Genesis 22, 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the place, the name of the place, Jehovah Jireh, as it is said unto this day. I want you to notice this. And if you're in the habit of marking stuff in your Bible, I would circle this. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So here in Mount Moriah, in this mountain, it shall be seen. Now, it and he sometimes in the Bible, there's an it that is a plan that is he. Let me explain. Genesis 3.15. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Where is this going to take place? Where is the seed of a woman going to bruise the serpent's head? In the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. You know what it says when Solomon built the temple about Mount Moriah? So it says, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Uh, it says in 1 Chronicles 21, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Chronicles 3, 1, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. Then say on Mount Moriah. In Mount Moriah, it says here, it shall be seen. In Mount Moriah, Solomon would build the temple unto the Lord. Look at verse number 15. It says, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. Uh, not always, but sometimes in, in uh, the Old Testament, we see the angel of the Lord as a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, sometimes he sends other representatives, Gabriel, or uh, it would be the messenger for Israel, a lot of times seen here. Uh, but here we're going to understand uh, this morning that this was the Lord Jesus Christ that is going to be speaking to Abraham. And it shows us how we can know this in verse number 16. Verse number 15, The angel of the Lord called out unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and he said, By Myself have I sworn. What does this say in Hebrews? Some of you know this. God swore to Abraham. Why? Because he could not swear by any greater. Listen, the angel of the Lord doesn't, if it's not God himself, he does not swear by himself. He swears by God because God is greater than the angel of the Lord. Here this angel of the Lord swears by himself that in blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you and by thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And I am face to face, Jehovah God, reconfirming my covenant to you, Abraham. Here's the reason why I'm reconfirming this covenant with you, Abraham, because you have not withheld your only begotten son from me. Now, now think about this sacrifice and this worship. God did not ask Abraham to give up, you know, drinking and, and smoking and carousing with, you know, women of ill repute. A lot of times we think about offering stuff up to God that uh, is sinful. And we should say, God, I'm, I'm going to follow you. The world behind me, the cross before me, right? But God said, hey, Abraham, I want Isaac. 
Now, Isaac, you know, uh, they say that, that uh, grandchildren are God's reward for not killing your own children. <laughs> and so grandchildren are wonderful, you know, you know. You're in your dotage and you get the dote on the, you know, on the little ones and send them off. You fill them with candy and send them home, uh, that type of thing. And uh, what a blessing grandchildren are. Uh, well, Abraham didn't have Isaac till he was up in age. So here he's well over 100 years old. He's got this one promised son, very wealthy man, but his wealth doesn't matter to him. What matters to him as an old man is his kid. And God says, I want your best. I want your all. You know, if God said, Abraham, why don't you offer yourself up as a second? Sure, I'm an old man. What do I got to lose? I lived a full life. No problem. He said, I want your Isaac. So he offers up Isaac. Uh, and so here the angel of the Lord comes and blesses him. He says, I swear by myself that I am going to bless you. Uh, and then you know what Isaac offers himself up as a willing sacrifice. And you know what Isaac gets in this chapter because he did this? He gets a bride. Look at verse number 20. And it came to pass after these things... Then it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath also borne children unto my brother Nahor, Huz his firstborn, and Buzz his brother, and Camuel, the father of Aram, and, and Chezid, and Hez, Hazo, and Pildash, and Jildlath, and Bethuel, and Bethuel begat Rebekah. Here Isaac receives his bride after he offers himself up as sacrifice. Uh, and you know what the Lord Jesus Christ received upon him offering himself up as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, is that he receives a bride and that we are espoused to one husband and the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, that you are married to Christ and you have a good husbandman this morning. Uh, so in the temple history, we see it all begins with God. It all begins with the Lord Jesus Christ, Melchizedek, King of Salem, that kingly high priest that is also a prophet. And it continues with the father of the faithful offering up his only begotten son as sacrifice. Uh, and then we see later on in Israel's history, of course, the establishment of the temple and we see the ceremonial law, the sacrificial system, 50 chapters uh, have to do uh, with the establishment of uh, the tabernacle and the worship system and all the different pieces of furniture and all these different representations. And Hebrews tells us they're the types, shadows, and figures of He that is to come. They're all pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, this sacrificial system. And because of the Lord Jesus Christ and because of what his life entitled, that this sacrificial system was an atonement for the people, that God himself could dwell in their midst. God could dwell with sinful man because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this sacrificial system, 50 chapters of details. And God, by His Spirit, put wisdom into the hearts of men like Bezalel and Aholiab and other men of God, gave them wisdom to build up the household of faith, and also wise women, the Bible says, and they, they, were, working, they were working fine work and, and um, weaving all these uh, fabrics together, and they made the tabernacle of God, and that tabernacle of God, of course, led them in the wilderness. Uh, but then God put into David's heart to build a temple for the Lord. And remember, first he went to Nathan. Nathan, of course, there's a lesson here. Nathan should have prayed and asked God. God, is it your will for David to build the temple? But the first time around, Nathan says, go ahead, the Lord be with you. That's a good desire. But it wasn't with God to have David build the temple. David was the man after God's own heart, but he was a man of war. Uh, and, and God was going to extend peace to his people and said, no, David, your son's going to be the man of peace and I will use your son uh, to build a temple, a permanent dwelling in the city of Zion, in the city of Jerusalem, in the city of Salem. There is going to be a fixed place uh, where my worship will be established. I'm going to move out of the tent of the tabernacle and I'm going to move into the temple and my people are going to come from all the parts of the earth and they're going to gather in Jerusalem. They're at that central point of worship and they're going to worship me in a house that is going to be one of the wonders of the world. And so David, he uh, gets himself in a little bit of trouble. He numbers the people, if you remember this. 
And uh, God said, the destroying angel of the Lord. And there was a plague among the people. Many, many people were dying. And 1 Chronicles 21, 15. If you want to turn there, you can turn there. 1 Chronicles 21, 15 and 16, I'm going to read. And it says, And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thy hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So here, remember Melchizedek stood in this place before, and Abraham was going to offer up Isaac in this place before, and in, in the mount shall it be seen. And here you have an angel standing on the floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, his threshing floor. And David built there where the angel was standing, it says in verse 26, an altar unto the Lord, and he offered a burnt offering and peace offerings and called upon the Lord, and he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. Uh, so anytime we see fire falling from heaven, it is very, very significant. This doesn't happen very many times in the Bible, but this solidifies in the mind of David. The angel of the Lord was standing there, and then when he offered up a sacrifice, that fire fell from heaven, and David knew that this was the spot. This was the very spot where this temple was to be built, and he would purchase um, from or in the Jebusite, he was going to purchase uh, this temple mount for the purpose of building the temple. And then Solomon built the house of the Lord in Mount Moriah in 2 Chronicles 3, 1. Now you can go over to Jerusalem today and you can see the temple mount. And uh, the Lord did say, and we're going to see that he predicted and he prophesied uh, that not one of these stones, now here's a Herod's temple at his point, not one of these stones will be left upon another. And I, I've been over uh, to Israel and uh, over in Israel, you can go to the one side of the Temple Mount and you can see like someone just wiped, it's like somebody wiped the dish. All these stack of big rocks just on the one side of the Temple Mount and the Lord Jesus Christ prophesied it. It happened in AD 70, the, the, um, the warrior, Roman warrior Titus came in, uh, the general, and just destroyed that Temple Mount and everything was just swept off of that top of that Temple Mount and it's all off to the side. But you can go there today. Uh, the Lord did say that uh, the Temple Mount was going to be uh, trodden under the foot of men to the time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. So there's coming a day uh, there that temple is going to be uh, rebuilt. You go over there uh, and you can go underneath that temple mount. When we were over in Israel, uh, I, I was there with an evangelist by the name of Brian Sharp. And Brian's been over to Israel a couple hundred times, very familiar with Israel. Very small strip of land, about the size of New Jersey, something like this. And, uh, it, you know, all these Bible stories take place in just a, such a compact piece of real estate. I mean, you've got Old Testament, New Testament history, and a lot of, you know, secular history all in one little area. Uh, and so... My favorite place when I was over there, by far, was the Temple Mount. Now, Brian, he is, knows a lot of people over in Israel, pulls a lot of favors. But I remember one night he said to me, he said, Jack, he says, tonight, uh, put on your running shoes. He says, because we're going to get farther into the Temple Mount than any Gentile has ever been before. So I, you know, I, I've never really been on the wrong side of the law. I've never been to jail. They never caught me for anything. <laughs> Um, and, but I know one thing, if you're in a foreign country, you can't waive the Constitution. You know, I, I have a constitutional right. I get one phone call. Uh, none of this stuff. You know, so I thought, oh boy, I was nervous. You know, I don't know what we're getting into. But so about 10 o'clock at night, I've got my best pair of running shoes on. And, uh, and so Brian Sharp and I, you know, somebody at the door. And he brought with him uh, this fellow by the name of Itamar Marcus. And Itamar Marcus is Israeli Special Forces. He's actually with a liaison with the United States. He's lived in Washington, D.C. at different points um, uh, when he was working for uh, the Israeli Special Forces. He lived in the same building in Washington, D.C. as Peter Jennings. Sometimes you'd see him in the hallway. So he was a high-ranking guy. And he, and he um, and this is saying a lot for being a Jewish person person, he was a very pushy guy. Just amazing. So he'd get you in anywhere 
and carried a gun. It's like the Wild West over there in some ways. He carried a gun right on his hip, open carry. Uh, so he's the one bringing us into the Temple Mount. And sure enough, we get in there. And it's just very fascinating. There's three different temples. So there's Solomon's Temple, uh, and that was destroyed by the Babylonians. And then Ezra came back in, uh, and he rebuilt the temple. And then during Christ's day, uh, Herod the Great really refurbished Israel's uh, Temple Mount there and just built it out and expanded it and made it one of the wonders of the ancient world. So you go down underneath, uh, you can go by Ezra's temple, you can see the gate and it's bricked up, but you can see the entranceway into the Holy of Holies uh, right there. So you can see the, the pinnacle, you walk past it, you're up higher. Uh, then nowadays you can look down through different areas, you can see the Solomon floor. You can see the big stones down there. Uh, there is one particular stone, it's 800 tons. Uh, so here's how big this stone is. It's bigger than any other uh, stone in any pyramid or any ancient building in the world. There's not a crane today that could lift this stone. They have no idea how Solomon, in all his wisdom, that God had given him. Here's one of the reasons why God gave him wisdom. It was to build the house of the Lord. Uh, and so this 800 ton stone. And then if you, you know, the interesting thing, if you read in, in the Bible, it says that the, um, the clanging of instruments was not heard in Jerusalem at this time. Uh, so where they quarried the stone from, they cut it per prescription, per size, and brought it into the city, and no one even adjusted it to get it in its place. Uh, so you can see the, Solomon, you see the Solomon floor, and we went down to these steps. We were not. We went as far as Gentiles could go. Uh, non-Jews, but uh, Itamar Marcus kept on going down and they were excavating uh, down at the bottom. They're always finding different things and uh, over there during this time period, uh, they won't say it, but they're really, really looking hard for the Ark of the Covenant because they really, really need that piece of furniture to establish the third temple. Uh, but I'll show you something very cool that it came up with. Um, that down there, there was a bunch of these. So what's that? Bones. Piece of bone. What's so significant about this? This is 2,000 years old. Uh, so, Inamar goes down there, he just grabs a handful of bones that are down there. This would have been from the, the worship system that is down there. Uh, now, if he would have charged me for it, I wouldn't have believed that it was really down there. You know, it was really legit. Uh, but, uh, especially him being, you know, a savvy uh, tour guide, but he comes down and he says, hey, there's, there's bones down there from the sacrificial system. Would you like one? Absolutely. And I got two of them. And I will sell those to you for a particular price. <laughs> It'll get your loved ones out of purgatory. Um, but I, mean, I, wouldn't, I, you know, I wouldn't sell to Well, I would for the right price. But uh, they're very, very valuable to me because I think, wow, this is, an, this is a piece of the sacrificial system that God himself set up by prescription, 50 chapters for his people to go through as a picture of he who is to come that would take away sin. And this is the temple history. Now let's talk about the temple prophecy, the temple future. Turn, if you will, to Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel chapter number 9. <clears throat> In verse number 23 down through verse number 27, uh, so Daniel is a man greatly beloved. Uh, there's two different uh, people in the Bible that are called greatly beloved. One is Daniel and one is John. And God gave both of them prophecies concerning the future. So Daniel, the, the, uh, the prophet Daniel, that's the Old Testament Revelation, okay? That would be the book of Revelation for the Old Testament. And then, of course, in our Bible, Revelation is that uh, unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we can't understand Revelation unless we first understand Daniel. Daniel is the key that unlocks the book of Revelation. Uh, and so uh, the prophetic timepiece for the book of Daniel is going to be this Temple Mount and is going to be a, a significant, uh, significant act in history, and that is going to be the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, Melchizedek, King of Salem. Uh, he, that Messiah, there 2,000 years ago, is going to be cut off at his first appearing. So if you look at Daniel 9, verse number 23, 23 verse 23, Daniel 9, and at the beginning of the supplications, uh, the commandment came forth, and I 
I am come to show these angel talking to Daniel, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So this prophecy has to do with two different things in particular. Thy people, the Jews, and thy holy city, which is Jerusalem. Yeah. Daniel at this time is in captivity in Babylon and he's praying about the people of Israel. And here is the prophecy. So he says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So 70 weeks, and God does a lot of things in sevens. Here's going to be a prophecy of 70, uh, 70 weeks. It's going to be 70 weeks of years, 490 years. Now Israel passed 490 years they were in the promised land. They never kept the Sabbath year. Every, se every seven years they're supposed to let the land rest. That was God's year. They're supposed to give that year unto God. They're supposed to have faith in God. Uh, and God said, if you, if you give me what's mine, you know, given it shall be given unto you, you know, um, that, uh, it, that uh, I'm going to bless you and, and you're going to th receive actually three times as much if you give me that seventh year. They never did that for 490 years. So what's, what's one seventh of 490? I didn't know either, so I had to get out my calculator in terms. Uh, so 70 years. So how long do you think Israel is in Babylonian captivity? 70. 70 years. 490 years in the Promised Land, 70 years in captivity, and then there's going to be 490 years future for the nation of Israel till the Most Holy is anointed. Till the lion lays down with the lamb, uh, till all the crooked is made right, yeah. till it says iniquity is put away, there's made an end of sins, uh, that the man of peace is going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. So 490 years left. 490 years pass, 70 years captivity. Uh, Daniel is being spoken to during the 70 years. And they said there's 490 years that is going to come here in the future. And here's how this is going to flesh out. Uh, he says... Uh, verse number 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy holy city and upon, uh, upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now here's how it's going to go. Know ye therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore in, and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, Prince, shall be seven weeks. Now, there's going to be an order to go rebuild the city. You can read about that in Nehemiah chapter number two. Uh, and we see Artaxerxes giving Nehemiah the order to go rebuild. So Nehemiah, he, he builds the walls around the city and Ezra uh, and his company finish up the temple inside the city. And this takes 49 years. So if, again, you look here, it says, um, from the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, 49 years. And then after this, and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So there's going to be seven weeks and then 62 weeks. It's going to be 434 weeks. And, uh, and then it says, and after threescore and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. So this adds up to 69 weeks, in case you're wondering. 173,880 days. Um, let me see, I have this written somewhere in my notes. From Artaxerxes' decree, now this is fact of history, not just because it's in the Bible, I always have circular reasoning, by the way. I'm just going to confess to you. I believe the Bible, and therefore I'll go out to prove it and come back to the Bible. Yeah, why not? That's so, uh, but there is historical evidence of this fact that Artaxerxes sent Nehemiah, uh, and, and scholars have the date pretty well figured out exactly when the decree went exactly. forth to build. So, uh, from Artaxerxes' decree, 1,700... Uh, 173,880 days after March 
5th, 444 B.C. to March the 30th, 33 A.D., which would be, you ready? <laughs> Luke, chapter number 19, Christ is weeping over Jerusalem. Again, March 30th, 33 A.D. Now, that's the scholars. We go to heaven, find out that's not right. That's their fault, not mine. But it's somewhere close <laughs> to this exact date here. So they say it was March 30th in uh, A.D. 33. Christ, the Messiah, would be cut off. So verse number 26 there, if you're in Daniel 9. And after three score and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now Christ, uh, we're going to see two different prophecies that Christ is going to say as we continue in, in Luke later on. Uh, we're going to see that Christ says, don't weep for me, but weep for your children. Because he's saying that the enemy is going to march in. There's going to be a great upheaval. There's going to be a great slaughter inside the city. So the people are going to come in like a flood. In AD 70, Titus comes in. The people use the temple as a fortress and hide inside the temple. And this is something that you do not do to the Romans or they were going to make an example out of you. Uh, and so they decimate the city and approximately one million Jews are exterminated and the city is upended and the city is destroyed. The Temple Mount, all these things take place. Uh, and so between verse number 26 and verse number 27, there's going to be a little, there's going to be a time of the Gentiles. It's going to be a mystery inside that time, that time period. That the, the Temple Mount is going to be trodden. And we're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ say that underfoot of the Gentiles uh, to the time of the end. You go over uh, to Israel today, you see that Temple Mount. There is a dome of the rock right on top of the Temple Mount. That The Jews do not own the top of that temple. They cannot worship on the top of that temple. Uh, and, and so it is in the hands of Gentiles. And we see there is about a 2,000 year gap between verse number 26 and verse number 27, which leaves one week left, a seven year period that we would know as the tribulation period. Verse number 27, and it says, And he shall confirm this Antichrist figure talked about in Daniel, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Seven-year covenant is confirmed. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. We would know this is abomination which worketh desolation. Uh, so the abomination desolation in the middle of the week, three and a half year uh, period, right in the middle of the tribulation, there's going to be some sort of um, defilement of the temple. And so it says there, he shall cause oblations to cease and for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and the determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. So we see the prophecy of Messiah cut off and then we see the prophecy of the Messiah coming back and reigning. Remember this, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we see him. At the beginning of the Temple Mount, we're also going to see him at the end. He said, I am the beginning and the ending. I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. Uh, the beginning and the ending. And we see in the book of Revelation, uh, which is reiterated again and again in the book of Revelation, something like this, where it says in Romans 1, 17 and 18, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last, I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And had the keys of death and hell. Look, if you will, back to Luke chapter number 19. We're almost done. Um, so, what's going on today? Temple Mount. Prophetic time peace. Well, in 1948, there was a miracle uh, that this nation that was scattered about the face of the earth for almost 2,000 years was regathered there in the nation of uh, Israel, and there was a rebirth of uh, the nation. Many people in, in many scholars have said for years that the fig tree in prophecy, the fig tree also in national custom would have uh, symbolized the nation of Israel. And when you see the budding on the fig tree, this, this generation shall not pass till you see this coming of the Son of Man. Uh, so in scripture, 
50 to 100 years is usually a generation, something in this time period. So we see the rebirth of a nation. Uh, and then there is a certain percentage of uh, these Jews over in the secular nation of Israel uh, that really, really desire and would uh, give their right arms to get that temple mount back. In fact, they are so prepared uh, to start temple worship. All they need is that piece of real estate and they can start worshiping on top of that mount almost uh, tomorrow. When Julie and I were over in Israel, again, this fellow that we travel with, Brian Sharp, every year he bring preachers together. And like uh, most evangelists, he's a very good salesman. Uh, and um, very good at evangelistic speak. Thousands and millions and you know, so we represented, us pastors represented tens of thousands of Christians back in the United States. I was one of these representatives, I'll have you know. So he, so he, he had this, um, he had this great, he had this, like this great feast, this evangelist, and he brought different dignitaries in, had rabbis and things over uh, in Israel, and then uh, the, um, the Palestinian minister of tourism, not terrorism, tourism, was there, um, se several other dignities, high mucky mucks, and they're coming in and they wanted to meet all of us. And of course, tourism is the number one industry over there uh, in Israel. Many, many pilgrims from all over the world want to go and see the promised land. Uh, so we had the fortunate uh, privilege. I mean, if there's anybody in there, I don't care about politicians or you know, even had rabbis and things, but we got to meet with a uh, rabbi who was the head of the temple Institute by the name of Yehuda Glick, uh, and Yehuda he he's got um, he's got a, he's he's redhead David, and he's got a he had a long longer beard than yours, and then he had the um, I can't remember, he didn't cut the corners of his head and had the curls coming down and had the head on and uh, and so we got to have dinner with him, and the Temple Institute already at that point this is about 2006 brought in 35 million dollars for the recreation of um, the the all the all all of the utensils needed and all the pieces of the furniture needed for temple worship uh, so marisol's been over there before and uh, you saw the big golden menorah they've got the you know they've got the golden candlesticks ready to go they got the showbread ready to go they've got the table of showbread they've got the altar of incense they've got everything uh, there's only one piece of furniture that you can't replicate that is the Ark of the Covenant. You need that because inside the Ark of the Covenant, there's the Ten Commandments, there is the uh, pot of manna, there's Aaron's rod that budded, and you can't, it's really hard to make, well, you can't, you can't make those I items up. So they have to have the Ark because of what it contains inside of the Ark, and that is the covenant. That's the symbol of the covenant between Israel and their God, and they lost that thing, man. Uh, so uh, here's, here's what... Um, Here's what tradition tells us, is that um, somebody found it and they left it in a warehouse in New York. <laughs> Not really. So but here's what tradition says, is that, um, that when the Babylonian captivity happened, uh, that priests went under these tunnels that would be underneath the city and they shut themselves in. Uh, and so it's underneath uh, one, one of these tunnels and they're excavating, they're looking for uh, the, this piece, this Ark of Covenant. And of course, if they found the Ark, just say this big if, and I would, I'd fantasize about them finding it, it'd be awesome. I would pay a lot of money just to look at, at the thing. I wouldn't look inside of it. So I learned that from the movie, if nothing else. Okay? Uh, but I would love to look on that. I mean, it, that, but if they found the Ark, I mean, they would have such support uh, from, of course, their own people and then also from Christians and say, yeah, go ahead and build that last final temple, build the third temple, and it will. Uh, be done, and we'll see that we're right on the cusp of the end times, that all things are now ready. We asked Yehuda about the ark. He said, he said, we will find it. I said, well, what about the red heifer? He said, we're generations from it. How do you know who the Levites are? Uh, we know that by DNA testing. So they say they, they've, got the, they've got the red heifer now. Some of you know this better than I. Uh, but they got the red heifer. They got the Levites. All they need is the Ark of the Covenant, and it's go. It's green light. It's go. It's worship time. They just need that temple mount. So here's the Lord looking over the city. Three quick things and we're done. I want you to notice the Lord. Uh, Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. Um, and so here he offers himself up as Prince of Peace. He holds out the olive branch to this people. The beautiful thing about him riding on a donkey is that the people get, by their own will, 
Uh, they get to choose to make Jesus their King of Kings and their Lord of Lords. They can say, rule and reign upon uh, my heart, Lord, I choose you now. Uh, someday, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But you don't want to wait till then to bow the knee. You want to bow the knee now. Amen, so we see the Lord Jesus Christ. Three things about him. First is his, his crying, his crying over uh, the city. And we see, as he looks upon the city, verse number 42, he says, saying, If thou hast known even thou, at least this thy day. This is Daniel chapter number 9. This was their day. The Messiah was presented to them officially, and the Messiah was cut off. Crucify our king. We have no king but Caesar. So he's rejected by this people, thy day, and the things which belong unto thy peace. You know what the Bible says? There is no peace for the wicked. Christ came to offer us peace and goodwill toward men. That the Prince of Peace was come and he offered his nation and they could have experienced joy and peace. Uh, think of the loss of privilege that these children of Israel had. Father Abraham, who tied to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who was, was, given, uh, was given the chance to uh, be the father of the faithful. And Abraham uh, begot uh, sons and, and daughters who uh, were given the law of God. And they were given the prophets of God. And they were given the book of God of God and now they were given the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Bible says this, to whom much is given, much is required. You know, I'm greatly concerned uh, for men and women who were once boys and girls who grew up in godly homes with godly moms and godly daddies who were given the law of God and given the word of God and had prayers spoken at the dinner table and family devotions and Sunday school teachers who loved them and prayed for them and ministered to them the word of God and uh, the opportunity to be in a Bible believing, Bible preaching church and had peace available to them and did not choose to go the way of peace and what the prophet said about them was woe, 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 Jerusalem, woe unto you. He's, the Lord Jesus said about his hometown, you've been lifted up unto heaven. Thou shalt be cast down into hell. It's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day than for you. Why? Because to whom much is given, much is required. And the Lord wept. We see the crying of the king. We see also uh, the calling of the king. Other parallel passages there in the Bible, uh, the Lord calls out. You can write down this uh, reference, Luke 13, 31 through 35. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, now that killest the prophets, would God that would have come to me, I would gather you as a hen doth her flock. You could come underneath the shelter of my wings. Uh, Psalms chapter number 91. Sometime we're going to go through uh, high, high points and high peaks of the Bible. Uh, just very common, beloved portions of Scripture that we all know and love, and we'll uh, re-preach those, and we'll hear sermons again about those. Uh, but one will be Psalms chapter number 91, the Psalm of the Protected Saint. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, wings of the Almighty. Uh, you know, um, here, here Boaz, that kinsman redeemer, that picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, that mighty man of wealth, he says to Ruth, he says, The whole city doth know that thou art a virtuous uh, woman. Uh, and he says, that The God of heaven bless thee under whose wings thou hast come to trust. You know, Christ is calling to you and I to run and flee to him. We live in a society that's headed for destruction, folks. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's right. Don't believe me? Turn on the news tonight. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we're full throttle. Yeah. The, brakes, the brakes are gone. There's That's no right. brake system now. And you know what the Lord's doing? He's calling to you, saying, come unto me. And the last thing that the Lord does here in regards to the temple, two times, I'm, I'm the first and I'm the last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the ending. You know what the Lord does in, at the beginning of his ministry? Cleanses the temple. You know what the Lord does right at the close 
of his ministry, he cleanses the temple. You know what the Lord wants for you and I? He wants our temples to be cleansed. There's several places that we could turn. But I want to turn to one last place and we're done. First Peter chapter number two. And look at verse number four. 1 Peter 2, 4. To whom coming is unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. The Lord Jesus Christ, remember he said, Peter, thou art Peter, but upon this rock I will build my church. He said, you're a little stone, Peter. That's what Peter means. Uh, you're a little stone, but upon this rock I will build my church. And so he says that uh, ye are lively stones. They are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious. He that believeth on him should not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same has become the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into a marvelous light. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and you know the Corinthian church have all sorts of problems. And he says, no, you, no, you not, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, Peter here, he, he thinks pictorially. He's always very, always giving us pictures. And uh, here he says that ye are the temple of God. Uh, that we are a habitation. Us as a church are a habitation of God through the Spirit. I was thinking about this this morning. And um, I was thinking about this in the Eastern culture. You know, we're very... Uh, America is individualistic, and I think we've grown even more and more and more individualistic. Um, Paul writes the Corinthian church, they defiled their temples, temples of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Um, and so he says, Know ye not that many are sick among you and many are dead because you've taken of the Lord's table unworthily? He says, You've been dirty, you've been defiled. Now, here's how I've always thought about this. Now, think about this. I'm just throw this out there. Think about this. We think individualistically. So, if I take the Lord's table, I might get sick. I might die. Here's how the Corinthian church would have thought of it. If I take of the Lord's table unworthily or defiled, other people in the congregation might get sick and they might die. I have defiled the temple of God, and corporately the temple of God, according to 1 Peter, is his church. Isn't that something? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Lord, we thank you for seeing the Lord's heart here, crying over souls. Lord, I pray that you'd help us just to run underneath the Lord's everlasting wings. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to come to you for shelter. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be clean, to come from you for cleansing. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, help us to keep the temple clean, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching our services today. It's been an honor over the last year. So many of you have watched virtually. You've watched our live streams. You've watched pre-recorded uh, videos of our services. And we are honored by your visit to this YouTube channel. Uh, we would like for you to reach out by way of our website. It's lbbc.info. On our website, you can find more about our ministry. Uh, there's podcasts available. There is 